with Dr. Jill Brown from the University of um, Bolton. Good morning, how are you today? I'm great, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to um, talk today. Hope I can help you. Well, it's all about you today. So what I want to know is a little bit more about you, particularly talking around your education journey. So sort of going right back and um, not necessarily going through all your qualifications, but just seeing um, how you've ended up at the University of Bolton. Great. I can certainly do that. Um, so do you want me to start with kind of my undergrad, just in very brief? Yeah, I mean, thinking about, thinking about, I guess, yeah, being sort of school onwards, how was education for you? Were you somebody who was really studious? Did you do really well? Was you always going to go to university or how, how was your initial plans? Yeah, I think if I'm honest, I was fortunate enough to always have that support and that vision that I could achieve uni if I wanted. And I, I suppose it was always something in my back of my mind. I wasn't dead set on going, but I'd always had that as an option and, you know, the choice to do what I wanted and the advice to work hard. So school was actually really quite good. Um, however, I didn't get the A-levels I particularly needed or deserved. I became quite unwell when I was in my A-levels and actually ended up not sitting one. Um, so it, it potentially, it, it struck my confidence a little bit and I thought, oh, I don't know if I, you know, can go on. But I got a place at university. It wasn't my first choice because I'd missed out on a whole way level. However, I was able to account for, you know, why I'd been poorly and what happened. So I did get into university studying psychology and, and that was really life changing for me. I was a typical student, 18 year old away from home for the first time. And for me, it was about the study. I always loved psychology, but it was also about meeting new people, about that diversity of peers and just expanding my thinking in ways I'd never done before in my life. So it was really about that well-rounded experience and I absolutely loved my undergrad. Um, worked hard, played hard. Did you do anything psychological before you went to uni? What was your A-levels? Yeah, I did choose to do psychology A-level. And if I'm honest, I didn't really know anything about psychology when I picked that. Um, it had interested me and I'd always liked the crime dramas in particular and those kind of TV programmes that focused on deviance and why people did these things. So I'd always had that interest without really thinking about it. So when I got the opportunity to do psychology and... I think it was the first year our A-level group got the chance to do it. And so the teachers were selling it as a, oh, this is a new subject, which clearly it wasn't. But again, it showed a bit of naivety about the area. And I thought, well, I will find out about people. And it was there when I decided, actually, I could do psychology at uni because I'd always going to be doing maths, which now seems so far away from anything I'm interested in or good at. Wow, man, that is completely different. Mm. Going from uh, A-levels onto university undergraduate, uh, how different was that? I think it was huge. And for me, it was about that shift in independence because uh, I did my A-levels, carried on at school. So it was a sixth form attached to a school. So it's still very much the teachers and you wrote down what they said and you regurgitated that in an exam. And there wasn't really that true learning, if you like, about the whys, the reason behind the inquiring mind. So when you go to university and you're actually asked questions and you're asked to think for yourself and read for yourself, I was still probably initially in that phase where I wanted to be told what to do and well, what should I read? And you get that to some extent when the lecturers give you a reading list. But again, it's about that confidence in oh I can pick my own reading materials and I can actually have my own opinions and critically debate using evidence so it was a huge shift and I, I probably didn't get that in my first year at all maybe even not my second year I think for me personally it really clicked into place in my third year which um, perhaps I'm a slow starter I don't know but it came good really good but it did take me a while because of that shift um, in terms of how I'd been prepared for university, probably. Yeah. So what does that mean practically? How did that change for you? Was it about suddenly it all becomes clear? You have a life path, you have a goal. How does, what did that shift mean for you? Yeah, really good question. I think 
as I progressed, and it was only in my third year when I got to study forensic psychology. So my degree course was psychology. Um, there wasn't any forensic until that final year. And that's when I suddenly really started to get it. I could apply all that core psychology. And like most people, there were some areas of my degree I struggled with more and I wasn't just as interested in. But it's like everything came together in the third year for me. Um, the passion, the drive, the understanding that I could work in that field. And at that stage, it was probably the first time I found out that I could go on and do a master's. Sounds um, odd now because we prepare our students right from the very beginning that there are lots of options and working or study. But um, it's not that long ago, but actually it is worryingly a large amount of years ago <laughs> since I did mine. There wasn't that employability or focus on what's next. It was all about pass your assignments and get your degree. Um, so it was in that third year where I thought, I'm going to have to think about what I do next. Um, and that's when my passion for the forensics really grew. It would always been there, but it was something I realised I could potentially work in and really wanted to work in. Something you wanted to be when you grow up. Yeah, I'm still not grown up, Lindsay. <laughs> I still don't want to know what I want to do then. No, exactly. Okay, then. so when you, I'm presuming, did you... Um, I am presuming. So did you progress from your undergraduate straight on from assets? No, because actually I'd had enough of studying at that stage. Yeah. And that, again, that's just me being completely honest. I felt that I'd really, because I had this late surge of academic kind of, wow, excitement. And I was working all the days and third year's pressured. You're doing lots of assignments, your projects. Um, I also, because things really clicked in, I took every volunteering opportunity I could. So while I was at university, I managed to get an experience in a medium secure unit. Wow. I managed to volunteer for youth offending team. I worked with the council in the areas that I was at university working with disadvantaged young people. So I was kind of put my all into it in the third year. So by the time I finished studying, I thought, oh, I just need a break. I'm not quite ready to go on. And because I'd done all that experience, um, within about six months, I'd got my first post as a psychological assistant in the prison service. So that was my dream. And uh, I thought I need to take this. So I moved area to an area I didn't know before. I had to get my map out and think, where's this place? But again, I was fortunate enough to do that. I was 21, possibly 22 at the time and had no ties and thought if I want to pursue this career, I've got to take a risk and I've got to go where the jobs are. And I was lucky enough to be able to do it um, and moved over to where I could work in the prison service. Wow. So what does that mean, a psychological assistant in a prison? What, did, what was your duties? Yeah, again, a huge learning curve because I'd never been in a prison, only seen bad girls. And I thought I was going to be like bad girls, even though it was a male prison I was working in. Um, so my duty is really to support the chartered psychologists. But I found very quickly I was delivering psychological interventions. So group work, cognitive behavioral programs to a group of 10 male offenders. Some of them were violent offenders, some of them were sexual offenders, some were serving life sentences. So it really was that thrown in to, um, what did they call it, discovery learning. Because yes, you go on training courses and you have practices and you do role play, but until you're faced with those behaviours and those challenges that you don't know how to deal with, you don't learn how to deal with them. I've just literally written down baptism of fire. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's what it was. Um, so I did that. I did assessments for suitability of programs with offenders. I started supporting the trainee psychologists with the little elements of risk assessments they were doing. Um, and then at that stage, it became a requirement because I, I knew that I wanted to pursue my training. So I'd had that experience and I was ready again for academia. I was missing it. <laughs> and I think I needed that little bit of time out. Um, so I got the opportunity to apply for a master's and again very lucky at that stage that the prison service used to fund them because it was part of the training route yeah. um, and I also managed to get myself a transfer back to the northwest because yeah. I'd only moved so I was all by myself for a year and a half um, very little money very poor quality of living in terms of a 
yeah, a really terrible flat that I had. So I was ready to come back to where my friends and family were and start to settle my life again. So you were still within the prison service, but you moved to the northwest. Yes, that's Thanks. it. So I managed to get a transfer. And with that, I was able to study at a Northwest University and do my master's and be promoted to a trainee psychologist. Wow. How did you find working in a prison? Because it's not something that a lot of people can do. You know, you, I, I wonder if some people have this almost romantic view of prisons and then they get in there. It is completely different, isn't it? It absolutely is. And I think in many ways it was probably the making of me. Um, looking back, perhaps I was a bit too young and naive to be going in at that stage and thinking, oh, I can be changing people or helping them change. Um, but at the same time, there's probably a never a right time. And again, you just have to be in that environment to understand it. And there were really tough days. There was days where I'd go home in tears. And you, I suppose for me, it was about developing a lot of resilience. So of course, some of the offenders weren't particularly pleasant as I used to hate initially walking through the wing as a young female and you would get comments, some were swearing, some were sexual related comments and you had to learn how to deal with that and not let that impact on you and see, well, actually that's a characteristic of the offender and something that they need to work on. And it's nothing to do with me or how I look or how I am, you know, asking for that. So I suppose if we're thinking about the psychology, you might blame yourself. Did I ask for those comments or, and then you realize you challenge it completely. And it was one of my supervisors said, you have to develop a walk, Jill. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's more like a strut. You have to have this confidence. Um, and they said, I always carry a file with me just to make sure, you know, I look all professional and it's just a, it's just a, a strut rather than if you go in there with your head down and people see it's affecting you, that may impact on their behavior further. So again, all the psychology behind it. Um, all with them as well, isn't it? They want to control you. And yeah, just partly, but yet again, that's the minority of cases. And most offenders um, in the prison service were so respectful, they would call me miss. So it says, how are you, miss? Oh. You're right, miss. Do you need a hand with anything, miss? Um, you know, so most people were so respectful. So again, not what most of the general public think yeah. about when you go in the prison. So it, it's that mix. You might have something, but it turned to be out of the blue. Similarly, um, people said, well, were you scared when you're interviewing lifers or you're doing your psychological reports? Absolutely not. And, and I never had anything but respect from the people that I was interviewing and the safety mechanisms were were so strong that if I needed an officer I could push the button and I'd have maybe 20 in the matter of seconds and never once needed that however obviously they were there in case there were any issues yeah wow would you ever consider going back working in the prison service or do you feel like you've done that being there got the t-shirt yeah, I mean, it's, again, a great question. And part of me really, really misses it. And I miss that idea of really supporting people, supporting change, making a difference in practice. Whether I'd go back, I'm not sure, because I am not a practicing forensic psychologist now. Um, so I'm not registered. So again, I would have to do quite a lot of CPD and get hours back. But what I found is I can satisfy that need through other work that I'm doing alongside my academic work. So I am doing bits of consultancy work with the police. I am doing support of local schools and children that might be more likely to go on to offend. And I still do bits and pieces with mental health services. So I suppose that idea and that passion that's always driven me, which is to help people, I can satisfy that in different ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So I guess we've jumped forward a little bit there, haven't we? So, yes, sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So you are now back in the Northwest and yep. you're studying for your master's. How does your master's compare to your undergraduate? Um, yeah, really different. Um, in terms of academically, it's a step up clearly. And I spoke about the step up of independence from A-levels to university. This is another level where you have lectures and sometimes you're thinking, well, how is this relevant? And where, are, you know, we don't seem to have covered this and there's so much that you have to do yourself, quite rightly, because it's a level seven qualification. So 
that academic element was a step up and I had had a, a couple of years out of study by this stage so again I was having to revisit referencing and things like that and just brush up on my skills but beyond that it was a real struggle for me looking back because I chose to do my master's full-time like many students do while working full-time and I was at the prison um, so it often meant a couple of really long days um, in the week on top of standard long days in the prison so I'd always have early starts I would often finish late but on a Tuesday and a Wednesday I needed to get from the prison drive about 20 miles 30 miles to university and then I'd be at university till nine o'clock at night so I wouldn't get home till about 10 which again it's it's not huge but it, it wasn't sustainable for me I could do it because it was, I suppose, a means to an end. I wanted that qualification. I needed it, but it, I suppose it exhausted me. And then it didn't really allow me that thinking time I really needed to do the qualification so well, because I'd be straight back into work, um, you know, and start work at seven o'clock the next morning. And I, I was thinking, well, when am I going to do my reading? So inevitably that was um, weekends, um, which is fine and you expect that. And many students struggle, hundred and they juggle 101 things. Um, but looking back, it, it was challenging to do the job and do that and then cope with general life pressures as well. Um, you know, life continues, whatever we're doing, whatever our situations. Would you do anything different if you could go back? to that time period? Yeah, I think I might have been a bit kinder to myself and done it part time. I don't know why I felt and other colleagues did because there was a few of us doing it from the prison. I don't know why I felt I needed to do it. It wasn't competitive. It wasn't that there was a race against time. It wasn't that I was older and feeling like time was running out. I don't know. I think sometimes I can possibly put too much pressure on myself and think oh, it'd be fine. So looking back with what I know now, I would have given myself more time and just to, to breathe and study and really read and think that everything just tended to be so pressurized for that year that I can hardly remember it if I'm if I'm honest, because it's just like a blur that it was just intense. Really? Mm. So what happened next? What happened after your master's degree? Where did you go next? Yeah, so I was still in the prison service. Um, well into my traineeship by this stage, um, working under the supervision of chartered psychologists. So I had my own caseload of life sentence defenders. I was doing risk assessments with them. So what that meant is I was actually presenting these psychological reports to the parole board panel. So there'd be a judge, there'd be a solicitor um, paid to obviously unpick my report. So again, in terms of resilience, so so difficult when I was new to that and again plenty of nights in tears where I thought have I not done well enough or they said my report wasn't good and then you learn you develop you you take a step back and you think how that person's paid to support the offender and if you've suggested they've not reduced their risk to get out then of course that's the stance they're going to take um so again it was about building up skills in terms of competence um, and developing clinical and practical skills. I was doing training in the prison service for officers, for example. I was doing training at area level um, around interventions and bits of consultancy for the management of the prison. So again, bringing in those research skills that I absolutely needed my undergraduate and my master's to be able to do it. So projects around self-harm, projects around bullying in prisons, um, some were a bit less glamorous, so I was tasked with doing some work around staff sickness because in the prison service, that was one of the key problems, staff being off because of sickness. And so they needed a little bit more information looking at trends and reasons and things around stress. So again, all the psychological skills just came in to do that kind of work. How, I mean, a lot recently about the criminal justice system in particular, how a lot of psychological theory isn't necessarily not, not, not accepted within the system, but it's challenged an awful lot. There seems to be a lot of misunderstandings. And um, I think the criminal justice system, the way I've been reading it, is kind of gone the way it's gone for so many years. They don't like new things coming in. So how was your reports received? If, you, if I'm thinking about judges and um, solicitors, you know, did you have a lot of barriers there with them? 
Um, I think, again, a great question. In terms of the judges and the solicitors, not so much. Again, some of the solicitors were employed to be little reports. So I did get comments made about you psychologists and you use, they used to call it doctor dot approaches and you're just painting by numbers and adding up and getting the wrong answers. Um, however, most of the challenges when I was there actually came from prison officers. Um, and you're absolutely right in terms of some of the psychological theory, there was this real misconception that we were there to, and they actually said, oh, you're just here to hug, hug them. And, you know, this idea that psychologists are warm and fluffy. And actually, that's not the point at all. Our point was to challenge. It was to look at risk factors. It was to revise. It was to manage. Yes, of course, there's support and rehabilitation in there, but it was far more than that. So we would have little kind of mini battles with officers sometimes who would always call the offender by the number or the surname. And we would always call them Mr. X or by the first name. And they'd be like, why are you calling them by the name? And, you know, from a psychological perspective, you're thinking, well, because these are, are people. These are people that have done a bad thing. But actually, most of the people in there have very, very similar values, have similar approaches, have similar skills and wants that we all do. The difference is something has overtaken that and they have allowed themselves to deviate from the social norms and the legal norms. So, you know, for me, that doesn't mean a person deserves to be disrespected because they've done something bad. And in terms of supporting them and getting them ready to go back into society, that's really important. So, again, some officers had some very negative views against the psychological interventions. And I don't know quite what they used to think that we did with these offenders. But throughout my time there, there was a real drive to get multidisciplinary teams to deliver these interventions. So they were psychological. I became a treatment manager. So I was managing some of the programs and we would always try and have prison officers trained as co-facilitators on it. And that was so important because then it was about this culture shift when they went back on the wing, but also that the offenders didn't see the them and us yeah. All of a sudden that, that officer was in there with the psychologists who the offenders thought were all right, you know, and they were quite respectful. But, and if they saw us with them and it, it really did impact how they saw some of the officers. So there was a lot of work to be done, but you're absolutely right. There was challenges at lots of stages where perhaps I wasn't predicting that. Yeah, it feels like there has to be a buy-in from the all the staff on the wings. It's OK. It's okay, all this stuff is being disseminated, isn't it? But if there is no buy-in from the people who are there 24-7, they're not then reinforcing your work, I would imagine. If they're in the background not believing in it, it feels like it could be detrimental to the... Yeah, the wing. and I think there was lots of evidence of that. To the contrary, obviously, there were so many officers who were amazing and supportive. And, and again, I think you mentioned before about, well, that's the way things used to be done. So again, it depends when people were trained, what their values were, how the prison service operated when they joined. Um, but again, now we've got new approaches to the training. Um, officers are trained in all kinds of things that they perhaps weren't previously with a lot more attention paid to mental health, self-harm, things like hostage negotiation skills, negotiating at heights, you know, all those psychological techniques yeah. that are really, really important and basic communication that it's not just a job to lock doors. That was decades ago when people thought that, but now it's really, really moved on. I wonder if a lot of the mindset as well is you're just there to make excuses for them because something happened to them as a child. Yeah, and I, I you know, I've heard that definitely from officers. Um, sometimes officers were resistant to supporting with research, so you would often require operational support to get questionnaires out, for example, and arrange with wings around unlock time. And I had a particular experience where people refused and then went to the governor who'd previously approved the research, but it, it did get stopped. So again, there were some barriers. However, for every barrier you face, there's some really good work and really strong things that are happening as well. 
and did you just say that you feel like this is has all moved forward now? And we are talking what over ten years ago when you were in the prisons. Yeah, this yeah, prison. yeah. Well over, sadly. Um, so yeah, I think it's massively shifted. There's new types of training programs. We've got the unlocked programs where they're looking for graduates to come in. And it's not just it's not about having a degree makes you a better person to work in a prison at all. But again, it's having people that can think differently critically show those skills like we we have in the game attributes around adaptability now more than ever um so when you're in the prison anything could happen you know you could be faced with a situation and it's well if it's not in the handbook what do i do you have to think independently you have to know how to keep cool-headed how to get support, how to work with other people, and also how to be resilient if things do go wrong and learn from that. So again, there's a, a real drive for those kind of skills that we're teaching now in our undergraduate and postgraduate skills as well. Yeah, I feel like critical thinking is incredibly important too. I know from yeah. my previous life, you, I was in the police for a period of time, and I think about my journey. I didn't have a degree. I went into the police, and you just kind of learn on the job. But I feel looking back, I was very one track because I was taught by the police to think like a police. Whereas when I came to university, suddenly that box is open, the world's colour, and you have to think for yourself and, be, and critique your own thinking. And that's what I feel is needed in, in these types of situations with mindsets. Yeah, definitely. And like any organisation, it's a balance, it's diversity of staff, it's people with different approaches, but it's it's understanding the rules and requirements from the professional body's training. But absolutely, as you've said, having the own personal skills and somebody could have a top degree, somebody could be quite good at critical thinking, but if they can't communicate in an appropriate way, um, and I've seen this with graduates thinking, gosh, I really fear that they might get a punch if they spoke to an offender like that. Do you see what I mean? So it's it's a combination of the knowledge, the flexible thinking, but also about the adaptability of being able to one minute go and present to a governor and then one minute sit with somebody that's had the most different life from you potentially, that's been through the most horrendous things and not to sit there with your clipboard, just asking questions, but to show that human side as well without making excuses. So it's not about, oh yeah, that's why you did this because of this, but it's about really understanding that person's life and what the function of the offending served for them. And that's where it becomes really challenging to do that case formulation and where all the psychological skills are needed. Yeah. I mean, I could sit and talk to you about the prison service for it. <laughs> now, so how long was your masters? So my masters was just one year. Just one year, and then yeah. But as I said, I crammed it all, and I was adamant to get my project done alongside it all. And if I could have changed it, I I would have given myself more time, taken the pressure off, and gone part time. Yeah. Oh, from the beginning, there was absolutely no need for me. And a masters full time is full time. But when you're working full time, you can't really find the hours back. So I have full time. <laughs> no, so something has to give. And I think for me, yeah, I would have, yeah, looking back, give myself more time. Okay. So what was your journey next? So I was continuing to work in the prison service, but it was an opportunity that came up from doing my master's. I had a really great supervisor, and I think that they really influenced the next stage, really, because they one day out of the blue um can't remember if i'd called them for a reference or something and they said oh jill um i've got a bit of money and i can pay for some teaching because i've got a research grant will you teach some classes and i i, I was really taken aback saying I, you sure you mean me i'm not sure you mean me genuinely this isn't being um kind of modest or anything and she was like oh yeah i've got these classes and you can teach every friday at this time um, yeah, there's only about 80 in the class and um, just just for uh, three hours a week. And I thought the imposter syndrome then was just off the scale. I thought I've, I've never taught. I don't know how to teach. I'm not qualified. And she's like, but with all your experience, it would be it would be great. And, you know, your psychology, you've got your masters, you've got this. So after a little bit of a battle with myself, I said, oh, well, OK, so I'll do it. So again, I managed to free myself out prison for half a day a week and make up the hours 
outside of that time. And I went to the university for a morning a week on a Friday to teach. Um, and at that time, it was actually, it wasn't even psychology students, it was speech and language therapist students, but they needed to do some psychology modules. Right. Um, and the first couple of weeks, I don't know, I was just, I was using slides that were given to me. I was so nervous. And then I suppose I started to relax a little bit and just to do things a bit more my way. And I started getting some really nice feedback from students and who were staying behind or dropping me emails. And I thought, oh, actually, I'm, I'm quite enjoying this. It was never anything I ever wanted to do. It was purely I did it just to see if I could do it and just to challenge myself. And then I found I actually enjoyed it. Um, so I continued it and I, I got more opportunities just to do tiny bits and more relevant stuff to what I'd been working as um, while still in the prison service. And again, it, it sparked this idea for academia, never being on my radar whatsoever. I was always going to be a psychologist, as I got to, and then I was going to be a senior psychologist and then a principal psychologist. And, and then I don't know, that was just the only thing I knew. So having this experience of just taking a lecture and a lecture data, I was like, wow, this is actually quite good. I quite like it. And I think I could be okay at doing this. So continued doing that. And then a job at another university came up through a contact and they said, there's this research post. And I think you'd be really good. You should apply for it. Um, this was more of a challenge because it would mean that I would have to leave the prison service and a battle with myself thinking, well, I've done all this work, I've done my master's, I've done my training, I've spent years, you know, really working for this. Does it, is it a waste of time? Does it mean I've wasted all these years? Is it me giving up? Is it, so I was in this huge battle with myself. And then I, I chose to see it a bit differently with a bit of support. So, well, no, it's about there being more opportunities and because my eyes have been opened up through academia, I thought, well, there's other things that I might really enjoy. And the prison service is great, but once you're in it, you do things that way and your options are a little bit more limited. So I thought, well, why don't I apply for this job? And I probably won't get it anyway, but then I'll be no regrets. And, and I did get it. Um, and it was a research job on a national clinical trial that had got a grant of five million pounds. So we're talking big scale here um, in mental health research, particularly looking at a psychological intervention to reduce compulsory hospital admissions for people from ethnic minority groups. And again, I've done little bits of research in the prison around offenders from ethnic minority groups. And I thought, well, and I've done bits around mental illness. I was like, I could, you know, this will be really good. Um, so I took that opportunity, but before I did, I thought I might be quite cheeky here. And before I'd accepted the job, I said, I, you know, I really want to do a PhD. And they said, okay, we've got funding because of this bid. Yep, we'll pay for your PhD as well. So again, I, I just got fortunate. Um, I had to ask the question, and but I managed to have a good research job and have my PhD funded on top of that. But again, it meant I was doing my PhD full-time while doing a full-time job as well. And there was a bit of overlap because of the data collection. However, it meant a bit of extra pressure, but um, by this stage, I was probably used to it and really, really enjoying it. So I got to work across East Lancashire and many parts of Manchester. So I think I had honorary contracts with about four different clinical trusts and with about 30 different community teams. So community mental health, assertive outreach teams. Um, and I was out and about with service users in their own homes and it was, it was brilliant. So absolutely loved doing that. I managed to get my PhD. Wow. Um, so yeah, I had a little shift at that stage and left the prison. Have you any regrets? No. I, I really, I realised that I worried I would have regrets and that's why I nearly didn't do that. And I thought I was safe in the prison. This research contract was only fixed for, I think it was fixed for five years. I think it was initially four, but then it got extended. Um, and I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to be unemployed. Whereas if I'd stayed in the prison service, I would probably have a job, not necessarily for life, because that doesn't happen, but much more stability. Um, 
but I absolutely loved doing that. And again, I'd kept up ad hoc bits of hourly lecturing where I could. Um, and when my contract was ending, um, obviously I knew it was coming to an end. It had been extended. I was still writing up a PhD. Well, in fact, I don't think I'd have really started writing it up at that point when it ended. Um, I managed to get a full-time lecturing job at another university. So I've, I've done the rounds of UK universities. <laughs> Um, and again, it's just okay, I'm ready now for a job, I'll look what's out there. And I got a job at a university as a lecturer, um, not as a psychology lecturer, but it was in health and social care because of my PhD, because of work in the prison. Um, it, but it was the psychological aspects across different programs. So I did a bit on nutrition programs, a um, bit on other, some, some bits of nursing and then got to write a degree around offending and the healthcare side of that, so. Wow. What's, so what's been your favourite time, would you say? Working uh, in the we've not got to the best bit, what I'm doing oh, yet well, now. I yeah, that was gonna be, but, that was gonna be. I was thinking up until this bit, yeah. Yeah. But, um, well, I suppose up until that bit, I don't, I don't know. It was all good, I really loved the prison and I've always, that made me the person. <laughs> Yeah, that made me the person that I am. And I think I'd be a very, very different person um, if I hadn't been exposed to that. And some of the challenges with it and some of the people. And I suppose, that, you know, a life lesson, just to be thrown in with all these people that you've you've never really experienced or contacted before. And, you know, in terms of diversity, again, you know, just eye-opening for me and again it's informed everything I've done since um just listening to you all that keeps coming through is strength of character I don't know many 21 22 year olds that could be thrown into a prison setting like that and, work. and I guess it didn't feel like that at the time but looking back I do think you know and there's this thing thank goodness there wasn't kind of videos of me or I had done anything you know training there's no evidence of that time of me but I do think if I was to look back or watch me Oh, I think I'd, I'd really cringe. Yeah. Um, but you have to go through that, don't you? So. Yeah, and obviously you did a, a pretty good job because of all the opportunities that have come from that. You used the word fortunate before. You said you were very fortunate um, to get the, the role and to have your PhD funded. But I wonder if it was fortune, if it was just you and your character. Hmm. I don't know if that's, well, that's kind. No, that's kind of, I, I suppose with fortune, there's got to be hard work. And um, like I said, I did, I did push myself too much at times. So I was hardly sleeping and, you know, trying to take on too much. And like I said, you've got life in there as well. And all the challenges that come around with family life, with um, everything that's going on. Um, yeah, trying to financially fund yourself when you're, you yeah. know, you know, especially in the early stages. Um, so yeah there is a lot of hard work and I think with hard work comes opportunities so yeah yeah I think that's what I mean I think language is really important sometimes isn't it and we you know we we, we almost like to downplay certain things well it, it just fell at my feet no it didn't you work really hard <laughs> necessarily fortune that's amazing so you're right we haven't talked about where you are now so how have you transitioned from doing your PhD getting an um, electric role in was it did health and so yeah health and social care applied health and social care yep yeah. and now um, you're Bolton. how did you get yeah it? so again with that other previous role I did threw myself into everything got involved in employability things in quality things wrote um a new degree program and that really started to excel um and Again, it was all about opportunity. Sometimes I don't think you need to be looking for a job, but someone could just mention something or you can just see it. And then I guess it, it's all for me, it's about a feeling. And if I can't stop thinking about, oh, then I think, am I going to regret it if I don't? And sometimes in a job, you feel like you've taken it where you can. And if you've exhausted the opportunities there, for example. And so I saw a job. Um, a Bolton and it was for the job I'm doing now which is program leader criminological and forensic psychology um, and I I was I had program leader responsibilities for some areas but I was like actually I want to get back I want to come home if you like that sounds a bit <laughs> silly but I wanted to get back to my passion for psychology and 
I'd been doing psychology, but it was, you know, stretching the application a little bit over areas that I wasn't as familiar with. And I say doing bits of um, work on some of the psychological elements of nursing programs, social work, nutrition, health and social care. Um, and I thought, you know, I want to be back with psychologists um, in that psychology world. Um, so it, it almost was about coming full circle, but as a different person, because I'd, I'd been on that journey. So again, I thought, well, I'll apply, um, probably won't get it. So it, it won't, it'll mean that I'm okay because I'm in a job I love at the moment, I was, and it, you know, if I don't get it, nothing, nothing mentioned, nothing gained. And I did, and again, knew very little about Bolton, but genuinely that's probably the best decision I've made. I thought, well, I'll go to Bolton and if I don't like it or if it doesn't work out, well, it's okay because I'll have some experience. And I think that has been the best decision that I've made genuinely. And I'm not saying that because I'm at Bolton now, but six years later, I'm showing no signs of uh, waning and I'm, I'm just loving the experience from, I'm still program leading the same program, but it hasn't stood still. It's had about three validations since I started. Um, I've been doing bits on masters. I'm now doing supervision of PhD students and chairing PhD vivas, doing bits internationally with curriculum and just taking on a lot of work all across the university with different areas, but still having psychology at the heart of everything I do. My day job is definitely the psychology of my program but I'm able to use that wealth of experience from the last how many years? <laughs> Quite a lot. Um, it, it feels like it's fitted together, like bits of a puzzle. And even though I didn't always know why I was doing things and I didn't have any plan. After I left the prison service, there was no plan because that was the plan to be a psychologist, senior and principal. But the plan had gone out the window. And again, that is the time where I realised you know, I was still young. There doesn't have to be this plan. And for me, it's about, and again, this doesn't always help me, but it's about not saying no. Now, on the flip side of that, sometimes I don't say no enough yeah. and I should do. And I need to sometimes think, no, I'm working to capacity. It's okay to say no. But again, I'm just thinking, well, every opportunity is exciting and it's good and it gives me new skills and I get to meet new people. So yeah, there's that element of not saying no to things that scare you or you feel uncomfortable with, but also possibly saying no when you're at capacity and, and the self-care as well and the well-being. Yeah. Are you still able to do research whilst you're at Bolton? I am, yeah. What, um, mm. what are your current research areas? So I've got a few little pieces on the go. Um, I'm still very much involved in the area um, with my research team that I did my PhD on. So around mental illness and particularly strategies and recruitment into mental health trials for people from ethnic minorities. So done a lot of publications and conferences around that. Um, still ongoing research around crime intervention programs with 10 year olds in local schools. So a bit of publication around that, but there's still some work going expanding the area. Um, just had some work published with another colleague from psychology around social media use and support for mental illness. And there's another paper gone in. Um, and then there's little bits that are going around more applied things. So we've got, I've got some work with colleagues around FGM with a local community organization in Bolton. That was presented at Bolton Hospital quite recently um, as part of a wider conference. So. I, 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 I always say I potter with research, like I love it. I'm not about the number of papers or the thing. I'm about what do I absolutely love doing? Where might this research be able to help people and how can I get involved? So that's what I mean by pottering. Yeah, it feels like a majority of your research is, is sort of centered around mental health, but with lots of different facets of it. Yeah, definitely really interesting it's interesting you mentioned fgm from what i understand that's massively on the rise in this country we haven't really heard of it since 10 years ago have we yeah that's really definitely yeah and actually bolton is one of the towns where we have a lot of people coming into bolton from other countries um and sadly they have experienced that so 
we've got a lot of data. It's longitudinal. And again, we haven't mentioned the C word yet, have we, COVID? We've done, we've done all this time without that. But we know that things have been taken over um, a lot at the moment. So that is on hold, but we will pick that up and just finish the data collection. The world's on hold, isn't it? <laughs> I know. But I think the flip side of that is how much, again, the adaptability and the resilience has come in. And by doing things differently in terms of teaching, in terms of research, supporting students, supporting colleagues, meetings, I think there's so much amazing learning come from this year about how we can do things better. Absolutely. I think a lot there's a lot of resistance in a lot of services, wasn't there? We can't do that. We can't do yeah. it that way. And we've had to. And I think yeah. moving forward, things won't ever go back to how they were. There'll be elements, but I think we can, we've, ha we've had to adapt, haven't we, over the last year? Yeah, and I really hope things won't go back. I think elements, and we need that social connectedness. Oh, we need that support for all our students at all levels. And it must feel especially isolating when people are doing PhDs and they've not perhaps been able to come on campus or, um, you know, even that cup of tea with the supervisor, that that can mean the world sometimes. Yeah. Um, but so we need, we need that connectedness. However, some of the ways we do things and, yeah, if, you, if you look at some of the forms that we used to do and now it's like oh, we can do things online that we never thought we could do and things are quicker more efficient and and supportive so I think yeah we need to look at the way we continue to take the good bits forward to support staff and students. Are you going to be looking at anything mental health related to Covid? Not personally um, I haven't really got plans to necessarily in terms of the mental health side, I think what I'm gonna be looking at, because I didn't mention, but part of my role here at the university, as well as a program leader, I'm also an associate teaching professor. So um, again, I can't, I can't say no when there's something to apply for and when I love it and getting new opportunities. So what that means is I'm involved in supporting the institution driving the Tiri agenda forward, so the teaching intensive and um, research informed. So what my work will be and where I want to position my research is more on the educational side and really formalizing what students want, what students need, thinking about the change in higher education. Um, so we're not gonna go to all distance learning. We're not a distance learning. University of Bolton isn't like that. University of Bolton is about that family community connectedness, support. However, we need to think well, what kind of learning spaces the students need. They've got used to the flexibility now of being able to watch things on recording and have online tutorials. So I think it's going to be a much bigger piece around the future of higher education. Um, obviously, we're looking at nationally, but also what our students and staff need and how to really maximise the learning from it. So that's the side that I see my COVID related research going not the um, psychological impact because I know there's so much brilliant stuff around that from all areas I'm right. doing work with the BPS as well and they've been instrumental in advising the government and advising agencies um, around that so I think I can keep out of that bit yeah maybe and um, okay so thinking about your journey what advice would you have for fellow postgraduate students out there what would you what would you say? Oh, really good question. I would say something, and I've mentioned this word a lot, about adaptability. And you will all have your plans of where you want to be and how you want to achieve it. Planning is important. I'm not saying put your plans out the window. You need plans. In order to get your postgrad, your PhD, you need to have a plan because you are working to timeframes you have a number of R forms to do. <laughs> I feel like I'm always filling in R forms for my students, but you have timeframes, you have plans that you work to, you have work schedules, you have different studies you want to do. At the same time, don't let those plans restrict you because research, studying and life can't always be planned as COVID situations told us. Some studies will take longer. Some reviews you're doing will take longer. If you've said, I'm gonna do this in two months and it's not ready in two months, despite your best efforts, well, it needs longer. 
So don't put pressure on yourself and be prepared to have that flexibility, um, not to beat yourself up or pressurize yourself if your plans need to change. Because by the nature of plan, a really good plan will be flexible. Discuss it with your supervisor, discuss plans that you've got outside of your PhD, with your family, with your friends, and don't be fixated or feel in any way you've failed if you're not keeping with your original plan. Because that original plan was right for them, but it's not right for now. So that would be the first thing. Um, and I think sticking with that plan is you will have a goal of where you want to go, what you want to do. You've probably, you're doing your postgrad, your PhD for a reason to get you somewhere, probably. However, where it is you want to be might not be where you end up. And that place you end up might be a hundred times better, like in my case. So I think the advice is don't be afraid of taking on opportunities, even if they're outside of your plan or where you thought you were going to go, because that can be where the best learning comes from. And even if that opportunity doesn't go well or you don't end up pursuing that in the longer term, there'll be a lot of useful learning from that, which you can pull back into your next stage. So in terms of trajectory, I used to be so naive and I thought it had to be on a line that goes up. It's not. It's like this. If I looked at my mapping and again, in terms of everything, in terms of money I've earned, in terms of time I've spent on things, qualifications, it's not like that. It doesn't go up. It's all over the place. And sometimes, you know, in the early stages before I even got to the prison, I was working three jobs. One of them was waiting on staff. One of them was market research in the streets. And one of them was working with young people in the communities. But it was just, what, what do I need to do? And what might help me? So again, not having this linear projection and being okay, it's not a backward step if you take on something that you weren't intending to do. Yeah. somebody once said to me that they would rather have regrets for something they've tried than not tried regrets for something that they've not tried yeah that's how I seem to think of things now just have a go I think that's useful and with that don't be constrained by your own comfort zone because if you're asked to do something and you think you can't do it I nearly turned down that lecture and really in fact I think I did say no initially um, because I thought I couldn't do that. There's no way I could stand and publicly speak and I didn't know enough. If I'd have turned that down, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now. I don't know where I'd be, but don't let that constrain you if it's just that feeling that it makes you feel uncomfortable and it's going to be tricky because that's probably where the best learning will come. Absolutely. You've got to. Like being asked to do podcasts, just got to do it. <laughs> oh, I can talk about myself, Lindsay, as I've shown. <laughs> How many hours have we got left? <laughs> yeah. We can carry on. So what are your plans for the future? I know you talk about not necessarily having plans, or at least maybe mm -hmm. a plan. What's your plan for the future? Yeah, um, I guess it's to continue the work I'm doing. I've started lots of work around the University of Bolton and progressed that. Um, in terms of the educational side of things, uh, I mentioned before I'm involved with BPS on the Education and Training Board. Um, that's a national board that really looks at curriculum for psychology nationally. It's looking at diversification of workforce and employability. It's checking for things like, well, who makes it through the training routes and the memberships in BPS. And it's also got the, um, the inclusion and diversity agenda running through it. And are we disadvantaging certain groups? Why are people not going? So I'm doing a lot of work with them. And I would like to continue building on that around employability for our students, because we know it's tricky, especially for psychology students. I'm sure other disciplines have their own challenges, but our challenges are about this idea that it is competitive. You do need to get voluntary work and not everybody's able to do voluntary work because they've got lives and families to run. Um, you know, things like getting on to the next training step. So we're looking at alternative groups and things like that. So I really want to make a difference in that way in education um, and drive that forward. And also just continue to develop my own teaching and research skills and keep my links going and learn from other people. Um, so I think actually I've just thought some more advice. When I was, <laughs> when I was in my training as a psychologist, especially as my assistant, it felt very competitive. 
it felt like you're against people. And I think that can be the culture of some of the training. Now, it's absolutely not like that. And gradually I've shifted to that, that the only way we can get where we need is with the support and by supporting other people. So a lot of my work is in collaboration with people some of which will have far less experience than me, but if I can use some of my experience to support them, brilliant. If I can collaborate with different universities or different agencies, brilliant, let's, let's share it. So again, it's this idea that if you can support somebody, then you're gonna have better outcomes for both of you than this idea that I need to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. It does, yeah. I think thing, people do have a sense of having to compete with each other, whereas I think we're probably all far stronger if we work together. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it can take you time to realise that sometimes, um, especially if you're applying for a job and you there is that reality that you are in competition with each other. But however, to get the skills you need to be successful in getting that job, you need to work with other people. And especially in the world of psychology, it's a small world. So I meet people now that I knew from my training decades ago and I come up with people or people say to me, oh, I know you, you did that session on such and such. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I know you, but then I do that to other people. And it's a small world. I've ended up knowing people with teams I've gone into or even people that have been on my interview panel. So again, it's about that professionalism and you don't have to get on with everybody in life, but you need to be professional and know that, you know, working together, you can really get the job done. Great. I don't think we've really got anywhere else to go, have we? We've talked about everything up to now in the future. Is yep. there anything else you think we need to talk about or we can talk about or any more do's and don'ts for students? Yeah, I think we've probably covered everything. I just hope it's been some help and I haven't just waffled on and got in my own little bubble about me. No, well, the whole point is this is about you. <laughs> it's about learning how everybody's journeys can be quite different. It, no, it's been incredibly interesting to listen to you. Mm. And I don't know how you managed it. I honestly do not know how at 21 you managed working in the prison service and then certainly doing your master's on top of it all. You know, I'm, I did an undergraduate degree, but I obviously now I'm doing my PhD, but I'm doing it all kind of part time to, to think how you've crammed all that in. Mm. I don't know how you manage it. I, don't, I, I think we all don't realise how much we're doing. And every person that's watching this, I'm hoping it's got some viewers, by the way. <laughs> I'm hoping there is somebody watching. Just think, like I said, just think about how much you are doing and what an amazing job many of you will be in balancing family life you'll have financial commitments you'll have jobs outside you'll be studying and then as I said I wasn't doing it through a global pandemic you are so again it throws up the barriers but I think the main thing is whatever you are faced with you will deal with you will get through and you'll look back and you'll think Do you know what I did all right yeah. and you'll have done more than all right that word resilience again isn't it yeah definitely my word of the day resilience and adaptability yes fantastic well it's been really nice talking to you thank you very much oh, for your time thank you it's been an absolute pleasure